Sorry? Ah, OK. OK. OK, let's start. So this talk is about closure free functional programming in a two-level type theory. Uh, let's look at what happens when we use monads in Haskell. So if you have a source code, which looks like this, just an ordinary simple definition in reader, and then reader is one of the simpler monads that people usually use in, in Haskell. And what happens if we compile it without any optimizations? Then we get something uh, like this. So we have the dictionaries for monads and for monad readers. And then we just have a simple desugaring, a simple type inference, instance resolution, and elaboration so that we get something with a very similar structure as what we wrote, except that all the instances are resolved. And then all the methods, uh, all the binding and the return for the monad is being also inserted into this code. But there's a bit of an efficiency problem if you look at this, uh, this output, because it's just really bad. We get lots and lots of closures. We get explicit din ex instances as runtime dictionaries. We get projections out from, his, uh, out from these dictionaries. So here, the lambda creates a closure, uh, the return, and also the binding itself creates even more closures inside its own definition. So this is not really what we want, fortunately. What we get from GHC if we do use optimization is just the code that we, that we really want. But this optimization is generally is very hard. And we don't need very fancy types and very fancy abstractions in Haskell. If you look at something like just a usual mapm function, uh, it's actually a, a third order and rank two polymorphic function because it gets a monad instance as an argument, which itself has a polymorphic high order function in, on the inside. So if you want to compile this efficiently, then usually almost all use cases should compile to first order monomorphic code. But what we start with is a third order rank two polymorphic code. So this optimization is quite hard. And just a picture to summarize what happens. So if we have a source, we first do elaboration, and then the elaboration is pretty predict predictable and also stable across versions of the compiler. And then we get to the core language, and then we do a, uh, some aggressive optimization on the core language. But that procedure, that optimization, is not so predictable and stable anymore. It's quite hard to reason about. We can use some compiler flags. We can use some inline pragmas, some specialized pragmas. But it is very hard to control. Uh, and then the proposal here is to have the source language, uh, let's do elaboration. But what we get after this round of elaboration is actually a bunch of meta programs, a bunch of code generating programs. And then after that, we execute all the meta programs which generate code, and then we get some core syntax. But at that point, it should be sufficient to only do conservative optimizations, which are also relatively pr predictable. And the idea is that the user control, like the predictability and then the fine control of programmers, should extend from the source all the way to the score. And these meta programs are also something that the programmers should be able to control. So essentially, we are taking the general purpose optimization, and we try to put as much as possible from that into user-written libraries. And the, uh, the paper explores, in particular, monad transformers and stream fusion using this design. Of course, we could do a lot more, but there's a limit of what, what fits in a paper. And then monad transformer is the thing that I'm talking about in this talk, uh, mostly. OK. And uh, yeah, so let's continue a bit. So there is this work in progress language. So the same code looks a bit li looks like this in this language. And it looks very much like Haskell. There are some differences. For example, the single colon is very important uh, as a difference. Uh, and, uh, and then we do some desugaring on the source code. It does a bit more work than what happens in Haskell. Uh, but after that, then the compilation to efficient code is actually formally guaranteed. And we will see later what we mean by this efficient code. So what's the setup? So we have two-level type theory. And this is a two-stage language. So we have, at the compile time, we have a dependently typed language. So this is very expressive. And then at the runtime, we have a simply typed polarized language. 
and then the two are smoothly integrated. And the general idea here is that you can have as much abstraction at compile time as you want, because it's going to disappear anyway. So at the runtime, we don't have to compile. We don't have to optimize all these fancy dependent types and abstractions. But then the object language is much simpler, and it's much, much easier to compile. And it's also polarized, which has some additional benefits in code generation. So more about this two-level type theory. So, so we have a universe of meta-level types. So this meta type uh, supports uh, dependent types. Then we have a universe of object level types called Thai. And this is polarized so that we have two sub-universes, uh, val type for value types and comp type for computation types. And uh, let's just look at some examples. So you can write a polymorphic identity function as a purely meta level program. It looks the same as in Agda, for example. You can write a purely object level program, which just declares an algebraic data type, and then we just write a monomorphic mapping function uh, over it. And then one thing here is that the list uh, is parameterized over value types, because we can only put value types inside runtime data constructors. Um, so for example, we cannot put functions inside, inside data constructors uh, by default. So we have this polarization. And, the polariz uh, and, uh, and in, in this polarized setup, the functions are computations. But then we have a separate type formula for closures, and the closures are values. And then we can, we can put closures inside uh, data constructors. But this distinction lets us control the closure creation through the type system. So in particular, if you don't use closure types anywhere, you are guaranteed to not get any closure types in your runtime code. And actually, when I mostly finished this paper, I noticed that I never use any closure types in the paper, and then I just put closure free in the title of the, the paper. So it's a bit surprising that essential usage of closures in practical functional programming is pretty rare, because usually we just use higher order functions and type classes, and we just want everything to be in line sufficiently so that only first order things remain in the, in the end. OK? And uh, so but in this, on this previous slide, we just have a meta program. We have an object program. But how do we mix them together? So the only way to mix them together is to have three operations. So one is lifting. So whenever I have an object type, I have this uh, lift of A, which is the type of meta programs that produce A-typed object programs. So this, this lift of A is the type of meta programs. Uh, we have quotation. So that whenever we have an object expression, we can put it in this kind of brackets as the quotation of t. And this is the meta program which immediately returns this expression. And we also have splicing. So that whenever you have a meta program, uh, you can splice it, which runs the meta program, and insert its output in some object level code. And these two operations are also definitional inverses. And, this, uh, and these are quite important when we actually want to do dependent type checking of this, of this system. OK, so we, let's look at some simple stage example. This is just a map function. And the map function itself is, uh, is a meta program. So we abstract over two value types. We have a function going from expressions to expressions, and then we get a function going from list expressions to list expressions. And the body of this map is this quotation. So the whole thing is essentially a quotation. We just quote a recursive uh, kind of helper definition. And at some point, we use this splicing to insert the output of this mapping function as code inside uh, this expression. And then we want to define something which actually survives uh, until code generation. Then we call this function, and it gets us uh, some expression as a result. And then in the end, we have to splice that expression uh, at this point. So here, we just get the same kind of let rec go, except that this thing is being inlined inside the, uh, the let rec. And this might be familiar to you, uh, because for example, uh, template Haskell. Uh, looks a bit similar with this splice and quotation. You might also know this from MetaML or MetaOcoma. Um, so this is kind of a thing that exists. But we can do a bit more in this particular setting because we have the staging information already in the universes. So we can do some bidirectional elaboration. 
and get rid of all of these quotes and splices, and also the lifts. So we can just write code which looks pretty much like ordinary Haskell with some minor differences. And this is pretty much unambiguous because uh, essentially we can do bidirectional elaboration to figure out uh, where the, the quotes and the splices should go. Uh, some things we still have to be explicit about. So if you look at this, so, so this is like a point of conten contention. Uh, the syntax that I chose is that whenever you have a meta level definition, you write equals. And whenever you have an object definition, you write colon equals. And it turns out that this is sufficient to make almost everything else unambiguous. So you only need to disambiguate the, lev the stages of the definitions, and after that, everything is, is very nicely inferable. OK, so let's get to Monad. So, so the type class is two minutes left. Okay. <laughs> okay. It looks like uh, my timer is what actually stopped. But anyway. Okay. So, so kind of the idea is the type classes only exist in the meta language. So we have a class for monads, and uh, just to speed it up. So, kind of the magic ingredient is that we have a monad whose side effect is generating uh, object level code, and this is some kind of continuation monad, and. Um, uh, and so the, so the idea is that we just have some kind of monad which is called gen. And you can run a gen action. And if you have a gen action returning an expression, then you can run it, and then you get an expression out of it. And you have some particular code generating actions uh, in this gen monad. So for example, this gen is something which creates a LED binding. So on the left, you can so see some meta program which generates a bunch of med, uh, LED bindings using gen. And then if we run it, then indeed, we get some lead binding. So this is not super interesting, but what we can do is that we can take some monad transformer stack and then put gen at the bottom of it. And now we have some monad uh, at compile time which can perform some code generation for it. And the idea is that if we just take something and put gen at the bottom, then we get kind of the code generator monad for the monad where we want to generate code in. So for reader, we put some gen at the bottom, and now we can express code generation for state. We do the same thing. And then we can also convert back and forth between these uh, things. And in particular, uh, now I can write a reader definition using a kind of a meta code generator monad do definition here. And what it does is that it runs the compile time version of this reader plus code generation. And in the end, we get the code that we kind of want. And we get some kind of fusion for he free because at compile time, we have the semantics of the particular monad, which computes obey certain things, like uh, get rid of these redundant asks, for example, because now this S actually has a semantic meaning. OK, and because we don't have uh, a lot of time, so let's just have a, some concrete example for compiling the previously seen definition. We start from this. We do an elaboration. We insert some squiggly things and some quotations, which is kind of unambiguous. We also insert some kind of down, this down thing, which actually runs a meta level code generation action. And then, because this is a pattern matching on an object level value, we also desugar it to some kind of construction which generates a pattern matching uh, code and then, uh, and then does something with it. But the point is, is that all of these things can be done in a fully generic and unambiguous way. So this is just purely elaboration when we go to this. And, uh, and then in the next step, we just run the meta program and then we get the reader code that we would get, which is uh, kind of the optimized reader code that we, we would otherwise get from from GHC. OK, so that's the basic idea. Uh, more things in the paper. We can also handle joint points, mutual recursive blocks, uh, stream fusion, some more meta tree, and uh, adaptation as Agda and type template Haskell libraries, which is a lot more noisy and kind of slightly incomplete compared to what's, what's formalized in the paper. But to remedy that, uh, the work in progress is making a standalone implementation of this, which targets LLVM. And uh, I'm also experimenting with trying to use this in the real world, in the Agda code base, uh, to do some kind of high performance 
a generics implementation, hopefully, to speeding up some parts of Agda. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for one question. And uh, in the meantime, could the next speaker go get mic'd up back there? And in general, each speaker should get mic'd up while the previous person is going, OK? So go ahead. Uh, OK, so how does that compare with uh, macro systems, such as macro ML and the like, um, which are using meta ML style quotes at compile time? Mm -hmm. um, so is that uh, uh, another macro system, and how does it compare with um, I mean, in, in principle, so this, this is uh, very much re related to ex existing systems. But I think the key features is that one is ergonomics and very strong guarantees. So essentially, full scope and type safety guaranteed through this whole pipeline. And also part of the ergonomics is the stage inference. And the stage inference is not always possible in the previously existing systems because mm. there's no uh, not enough information in types to be able to disambiguate the stages. And uh, also, you have fewer annotations. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, uh, and then also, there is this heterogeneity that we have dependent types at compile time and then polarization at runtime, which I think is very important. And I don't think this exists in, in previous uh, systems. Thanks. Let's thank our speaker again.